Before we examine Guillermo del Toro's undertaking, let's take a minute to briefly explore the history of Lovecraft adaptations. Filmmakers have long been stymied by the author's many peculiarities. Adaptations of his stories, successful or not, can teach us a great deal about what makes Lovecraft's writing so formidable, and why a visual translation can be so troublesome. Since Lovecraft was not a popular author in his lifetime, and because his work has been subject to a long-standing copyright dispute with ambiguous status in the public domain, the interest in film adaptations of his stories has long been erratic. He remained a relatively unknown figure for at least 20 years after his death. It was only thanks to the efforts of a small handful of dedicated genre enthusiasts that his work survived to achieve any mainstream exposure at all. The earliest attempts to bring Lovecraft to cinema screens were spearheaded by director and producer Roger Corman, legendary king of low-budget genre flicks and drive-in monster movies. Corman had been rising to a new level of respectability in the 60s with a cycle of resourceful and lucrative gothic horror films adapted from the work of Edgar Allan Poe. In 1963, looking to break from this routine, Corman temporarily turned his attention to the lesser-known H.P. Lovecraft, whose work was just beginning to gain a larger following. He adapted The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, one of the author's longer and more narratively ambitious pieces, into an atmospheric movie called The Haunted Palace. It's good, and frequently very creepy, but it foregoes most of Lovecraft's cosmic horror in favor of a more classically assured gothic style. Corman's distributor forced the hasty addition of quotes from a poem by Edgar Allan Poe, Lovecraft's name was buried in the credits, and the finished film was released as Edgar Allan Poe's The Haunted Palace. There was similar treatment for a 1965 adaptation of The Color Out of Space, directed by Corman's colleague Daniel Haller. This film gets a little closer to Lovecraft's tone, but again it was given a gothic marketing treatment and released under a more generic, sensational title, Die Monster Die. Lovecraft this time was at least granted a small mention on the film's poster. Corman and Haller teamed up a few years later for 1970's The Dunwich Horror, which Corman produced and Haller directed. Setting itself apart from previous efforts, it openly featured Lovecraft's name in its marketing, and it eschewed most of the gothic elements seen in prior adaptations. Haller took a stab at a more psychedelic approach, arguably the first attempt to establish some kind of visual analog to Lovecraft's uncanny effect. It's a significant piece pointing out two of the primary challenges inherent in Lovecraft's style. First, there's the issue of his monsters, which present a logistical problem. They tend to be completely inhuman physical abominations. The central monster of the Dunwich Horror is described as a formless mass of eyes, mouths, and tentacles, and it spends most of the narrative in a liminal state that renders it imperceptible to human vision. This is compelling to read about, but it almost almost always results in awkward designs that don't entirely work on screen. Haller works around this by using delirious color flashes and menacing point of view shots whenever the monster is featured, which is not a bad solution considering the limited resources to which he had access. But much more difficult is the challenge presented by the inner mechanics of Lovecraft's stories. The scariest thing about a Lovecraft story is not really what it describes. It's what it suggests. Lovecraft's greatest gift was his ability to use ornate language to convey a colossal sense of vague, looming threat. Behind every description was the suggestion that something even more horrible had either been averted or remained forever lurking somewhere in the infinite shadows outside of human understanding. The stories ingeniously play with the reader's imagination by reaching into what the author himself described as humanity's oldest and greatest fear, the fear of the unknown. But if a story is about things outside of human understanding, or even outside of observable space and time, this begs the question, how do you film that? The only possible solution is a creative one, finding ways to use cinematic tools that replicate the author's literary tools. Not an easy thing to do, and this is the biggest obstacle in adapting his work. 
Another direct attempt following on the Dunwich Horror would not be seen for another 15 years. In that time, Lovecraft's reputation began to grow exponentially. Allusions, references, homages, and parodies started turning up everywhere. Successful horror authors like Stephen King paid tribute to him in their stories. Satirists like Terry Pratchett spoofed elements of his style. Tabletop games like Dungeons & Dragons took inspiration from his elaborate mythology. Lovecraftian entities began to make routine appearances in Marvel and DC Comics. In film, too, the influence was strong. Sam Raimi lifted the Necronomicon for his Evil Dead series. Italian gore maestro Lucio Fulci borrowed Lovecraft's settings for his own films. John Carpenter brought to life semi-Lovecraftian horrors in The Thing, and he would go on to conjure more of the author's cosmic pessimism in later films like Prince of Darkness and In the Mouth of Madness. It wasn't until Stuart Gordon made Reanimator in 1985 that Lovecraft would again appear in the actual credits of a film. As an indication of how much more name recognition he had acquired by this time, the author was given a featured spot right over the movie's title. Gordon, who began his career in experimental theater, deliberately chose to adapt one of Lovecraft's most shamelessly lurid stories, Herbert West Reanimator, about a mad scientist who concocts a formula for raising the dead. It's a great horror film, but it's not exactly Lovecraftian, nor does it really intend to be. Gordon aims squarely for the lower side of the author's style, and to his credit, he hits his mark spectacularly well. Reanimator is a perverse roller coaster of pulpy horror, tongue-in-cheek comedy, and extremely inventive practical makeup effects. Gordon's next film, From Beyond, released in 1986, wound up achieving something much more explicitly Lovecraftian. It's another of the author's mad scientist tales, this one featuring a machine that opens up perception to bizarre spaces between the dimensions of our universe, which naturally allows unspeakable horrors to cross the dimensional barriers. Massive advancements in special effects technologies allowed Gordon to realize some of the most graphic depictions of Lovecraft's inhuman terrors ever put on screen. The flamboyant visual style, garish lighting, freakish imagery, and progressively nightmarish tone make this one of the most enjoyably over-the-top Lovecraft movies. Unlike Reanimator, it sadly wasn't a financial success. Gordon went on to make several more Lovecraft adaptations, including the underappreciated Dagon in 2001, but he never again reached the same demented heights. Following Reanimator, there was a steady and unprecedented quantity of Lovecraft adaptations, some interesting, others just embarrassing. Much of it was relegated to the direct-to-video market, and unfortunately there was very little that made any discernible impact. Meanwhile, Lovecraft's influence continued growing. Tributes and homages were coming in even greater volume. Video games like Alone in the Dark sought new ways to adapt his atmosphere. Board games like Arkham Horror tried to put players inside his universe. By the 2000s, Lovecraft was everywhere, so much so that Cthulhu even started making cameos in children's TV shows. Film adaptations were becoming routine, and Lovecraftian horror was being accepted as a recognizable genre. Cyclopean monsters threatened ordinary people in Frank Darabont's The Mist. Eldritch beings awakened from their slumber in Cabin in the Woods. Indie films like The Void crafted lovingly handmade cosmic fears. Directors like Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead put their own spin on the Lovecraftian blend of sci-fi, horror, and fantasy. Even Robert Eggers' bizarre and unclassifiable The Lighthouse could at least be called Lovecraft-adjacent. The author was proving a bottomless well of inspiration, but again, Filmmakers continued struggling to pull off a direct adaptation. The ones that did appear started to grow more imaginative. One highlight was a 2005 silent film version of The Call of Cthulhu, made to appear as if it were made in the 1920s, contemporaneous to Lovecraft's original story. It's a clever use of an archaic form, allowing for a very literal translation and distinctly suited to the story's atmosphere. Another strong outing was Richard Stanley's Color Out of Space. The film starred Nicholas Cage as a farmer slowly losing his mind to inexplicable forces, after an otherworldly color from outer space somehow starts to warp reality. Stanley leans hard into the story's weirdness, and it's effective because, like Lovecraft, he denies the possibility of a coherent explanation. Within the last few years, the popular engagement with the author's work has grown even more overt and in-depth. 
One of the most provocative efforts was Lovecraft Country, the first to confront the author's notorious racism and the deep complications of his legacy. For years, Lovecraft's many racist sentiments were almost like a dirty secret amongst fans, something that was painfully obvious to anyone who'd read a certain amount of his work, but always a topic people seemed reluctant to openly discuss. With the author having progressed well beyond cult stardom into mainstream ubiquity, his prejudiced attitudes can no longer remain unexamined. Lovecraft Country does a great job of celebrating the author's brilliance, while also taking him to task for his bigotry. All of these adaptations reveal different sides to the author's work. They explore facets from the high to the low, from the excellent to the ugly. None of them capture everything, but taken as a whole, it's a rather stunning indication of just how much personal depth and flaw Lovecraft infused into his style, which was really a catalog of his own fears, obsessions, and limitations. He's less a presence now and more of a fixture. It's entirely possible that he's done more to shape the current state of horror than any other single author, and his work still hasn't been mined for everything it has to offer.